you got your first assignment for the semester. So assignment 201 is uh, to design a table and a chair. It only has to be one chair and one table. I'm pretty loose with the definition of what defines a table. Uh, my definition is it's something you can put something on. Uh, and a chair is something you can sit on. That's about it. So we're, we're deliberately being vague so that you guys can have some fun and creativity. I'm not overly worried about gravity when it comes to the chair either, or structural integrity. Um, I want it to be nice. I want it to be well modeled. Um, the, the key things on it are, did you model it well? Were you able to, to build what you wanted to build? Is it, is it interesting to look at? You know, I mean, don't make me a cube and call it a day, right? Something interesting. You know, spend time actually designing something that I want to look at. Uh, and then the other part of it is going to have to do with how the textures are applied, the fact that textures are applied, materials are applied, and how they look. Are they appropriate scale? We haven't talked about that yet. That's coming. Are they the appropriate scale? Do, do they look realistic? Those kinds of things. I am not asking for any kind of a background. So this is kind of like those old Apple commercials where you're on this white plane in a white sky. Uh, with nothing else, you just have your table and chairs. So uh, no background, no context, just the table and just the chair. Um, so that's it. Oh, in terms of what you're turning in, you're giving me three, quote, perfect renderings of this. So three different angles showing me that table and that chair. Don't, please don't forget to give me three. It's, it's amazing to me how uh, people lose their attention to detail and they turn in one rendering. Okay? If you turn in one rendering, you just got yourself, best case, a 33% on the assignment. Best case. So just don't give me three. right? And this is the same thing throughout the semester. Most people can manage three renderings for this first one, but by the end, like when we're doing the light fixtures or whatever, they like do one rendering of the two light fixtures that you need. And it's like, no, that's not enough. Like, make sure you read what I'm asking for and give me that, please. Don't leave stuff out because it's just wasting points. So I will emphasize that when it gets a little bit closer as well. Today we're going to build a piece of a concrete bridge um, and we'll get some texture on it. Today it'll end up being pretty scripted in terms of, you know, do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. Uh, the goal is that in another week or two, you guys will then start to make something on your own. So you'll have to figure out, okay, if, and I'll, I'll start with like a window and it'll be, how do I, how do I figure out how to make a window? You know, what shapes am I going to use? How am I going to combine things together? What am I going to do? So I'm really just trying to, uh, over the next week or so, build up your skill set such that then I can say, okay, now we're going to start with a simple object that you have to figure out how to make as opposed to a set of steps. So we're still in the realm where there's no need to do any comments or anything on this because we're all making the same thing. We're all following the same set of steps. Um, I've deliberately made some parts of this shape more complicated so that you end up having to deal with the complications of it. Um, today we'll focus a lot on how do, how do joints come together, how do we control edges and, and corners and that sort of thing. Um, so I've gone ahead and I've opened up Rhino. Um, I'm going to start with a new document that is in the large object inches template. That's the template we'll be using throughout the semester, but I'm just double checking that here. So it'll be large object inches. I'll go ahead and say open. That will open up the large object inches template. Before I get started, I'm going to go up to my options because I haven't done that just yet. So we're going to go to tools and then options all the way to the bottom under view, OpenGL, and I'm going to turn off that tessellation option, which is what causes those lines not to show up. We'll go ahead and say OK. And now I can actually start to get started here. Um, I'm going to start working by drawing in the top view, uh, and I'm going to end up drawing the shape that's down here at the bottom. And you'll see that there's repetition built in, like we'll have to use Rotate 3D and you know, some of the stuff that we learned last class. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and move into the top view for what I'm doing. And I'm going to go ahead and turn on some of my object snaps down here at the bottom. So I'll turn on end, mid, and perpendicular. Those are the three that I like to leave on while I'm working. And the other ones I'll toggle on and to toggle off as I need them. So we're going to go ahead and start making the shape that's down below. The measurements on this shape are in inches. So when I start to draw, and I'm going to do it in front of you as well, I'm going to use the polyline tool. And I'm going to start right there at the origin. Does it really matter? No, but I'm going to go ahead and start right at the origin. So I'll type 0, 0 and hit Enter on the keyboard. And that starts right at the origin. And I'm going to use essentially the distance and direction method 
to draw. I'll turn on ortho so that I'm going straight up. Alternatively, I can hold down shift on the keyboard. That would do the same thing. And now I'll go ahead and start to draw. So the first thing I need is the height. So it's at 36 inches. And so I'll go ahead and type in 36. I don't need the inch sign, but it is going to ask me conf to confirm the direction. So I want it to be going straight up. So it's one more click of the mouse. The next one over here is I'm going to go over by four inches. And so that then gives me the four inches. Now this was deliberate on my part. The outside edge of this slopes away. So this is a hard one to draw. And what people have a tendency to do is they draw straight down and then over to get that slope. This is a perfect opportunity, though, to use those relative coordinates that I talked about when we were doing the 2D drawing lecture, the second one, exercise 202. This is where we'd throw the at sign in place. So relative to the last point that I clicked, I want to go negative 2 in the x direction, followed by negative 36 in the y direction. And suddenly, I have that angle without having to draw a guideline and then draw an extra line. So it saves me some steps just by knowing that I can switch to this method. So it's at negative 2, comma, negative 36. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And that gives me the slope on the outside of this shape. We're then going to go down by 6 inches. So I'll go ahead and type in 6 inches. It's going down. And here's another opportunity for my relative coordinates. So in this case, it would be at, so relative to that last point, I want to go over by 30 inches. So it's not negative, it's positive this time, so 30. So at 30, comma, negative, and I'm going down another 6 inches. So I'm looking at the drawing on my sheet here and saying I want to go down a negative 6 inches, and I'll press Enter. That gives me that lower part of the little um, cross-section here. So you guys all have the handout in front of you, uh, so, you, so you're referencing it there. But of course, you could go into our exercises. Um, sorry, wrong class here. Uh, or if you're having trouble seeing it or, or what have you, it's right there. So you can always, always look at it there as well. So I've drawn that. Now I have to continue on with my shape. Now one of the things that I'll point out today is that there are some efficiencies built into this shape such that I wouldn't actually have to draw the whole shape. I could draw smaller bits of it. But for practice, I'm going to end up drawing the whole thing. So this is virtually almost all I need to keep going because I could mirror this whole shape. But we'll keep drawing for the practice of it. So I'm going to use my relative coordinate. So relative to that last point I clicked, I'm going to go over another 30 inches. So I'm still going positive in the x direction. But this time, I'm going up by 6 inches. So instead of typing negative 6, it's just going to be 6. And I'll press Enter. And that gives me that side of the slope. I'm going to go up straight by 6 inches. So I'll type in 6 inches. And then I'll click on my direction. There it is. This is one where it's sloping back. So it's another time when I'm going to use the at sign. So relative to the last point, I want to go over by negative 2 inches. So negative 2 in the x direction and up by 36 in the y direction. And I'll press Enter. So one of the tricky things about that is really just understanding which one is negative and which one is positive and why I'm going in the order that I'm going. So it just takes a little bit of practice. So the rest of this is pretty easy. We're going to go over by 4 inches. We're going to go down by 36 inches. And then we'll end right where we started. So I want to snap right to the end there to finish. Alternatively, I could press C to close the shape. And that gives me that closed polyline shape right there. So like I said, alternatively, I could draw just half the shape. So I could start here and go um, 24 up by 36 over by 4 at negative 2 comma negative 36. Oops, helps if I can type correctly. Uh, at negative 2 comma negative 36. 6 inches at 30, comma, negative 6, and finish there, thereby drawing just a quarter of the shape. And then I could, if I needed it, mirror this like that to create the other half of the shape. So you don't always have to do it by drawing the whole shape. But again, we're practicing today, so extra drawing doesn't hurt. So I'm always going to show you these little tricks along the way to get you um, faster at how you work. So the next thing that we need to do is I'm going to switch from the top view 
over into the perspective view. So I'll go ahead and double click to make the perspective view large. And then I want to use Rotate 3D, which we used last class, to make this stand up in place. Now where I rotate my 3D from doesn't really matter. Um, I could rotate it right here. I could also rotate it down here at the bottom. I think it's easiest to rotate it right there on the walking surface, so we'll stick with that. I'm going to use Rotate 3D, which is available under the Transform menu, and I'll, type ro or I'll select Rotate 3D. Alternatively, I could type in Rotate 3D. It's going to ask me to select my objects to rotate. That would be this. I'll go ahead and press Enter. And then it'll ask me for the rotation axis. So like I said, the rotation axis can be the walking surface of this. So from there to there. And then I need my angle or first reference point. We'll choose the first reference point being right there. And I have ortho turned on, so it's really easy. It just snaps right up at 90 degrees. If I didn't have ortho turned on, it could go anywhere in between, but I could hold down the shift key on the keyboard and that would allow it to snap to 90 degrees as well. So our goal there is to have this standing up like this so that we can start to build this out. So I have the first piece here. I'm going to use the offset command to make another copy of this four feet back. So if I have it selected and I go to curve uh, offset, offset curve. Notice that in this case, it's, it's wanting me to offset it in this plane that I'm working in. Um, I want it to go back this way. So right here in my side to offset options, instead of saying in C plane, no, I'm going to say in C plane, yes. And suddenly this is now going back in space instead. And I could type in 48 inches or four feet and you can see that it's going back 48 inches as opposed to out by 48 inches. So again, that was just by choosing this in C plane set to yes, and then it'll offset either to the front or to the back. I want it going to the back, so I'll go ahead and click there as well. And so that gives me two curves from here and from here. Now on the next part of this, this is on step four of the handout, I ask you to type explode. And you don't really need to explode it, you could explode this after the fact, but for the purposes of practicing, I'm going to show you the exploded version and then I'll go back and, and actually I'll do it un unexploded and then I'll do it exploded. So what we're going to do is we want to create surfaces that go between these two curves, which is an ideal place to use the loft command, which we've used before. And if I were to take these two surfaces like that and go up to um, surface and then loft, so second one down there, it's going to ask me to select the seam. So I want this to match up on both of these curves so that when I create the surface, let me switch over into shaded mode so you can see it, it's creating the surface where I've got flat panels between each of these shapes. If, when I go to do the loft, oops, sorry, my seam is not there, let's say they don't match and they're like that, when I go to create the shape, I'm going to get a very different result with how this loft comes together. So that's not what I wanted my shape to look like. So we can do a loft. So I can go to surface and then loft my seams in the right spot like that, which gives me one continuous poly surface all the way around. And then I could explode the poly surface to give me individual surfaces. Alternatively, I could explode the curves first and then select opposing curves and loft each individually, like that and like that, all the way around. So it's just different methods of doing it. Obviously, this is, uh, ends up being a little bit um, more time consuming than lofting the whole thing together, like this. So I'll take those two and then loft. I do want them uh, broken into separate pieces, though, at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and type in explode so that they are individual little surfaces. I'm not keeping them together. So at this point, I have the surfaces going around my object, but I don't have the surfaces on the end. It's still hollow here. So I'd like to fill those pieces in. And so I'll do that by using the surface from three or four corner points, and I'm going to fill in this surface right there first. So I fill that piece in. 
The next one that I'm going to fill in, I'm going to ask you to do it this way on purpose because it's, uh, unfortunately, it, um, when we go to do something later on, this will be the cleanest way of doing it. So when I pick the surface from three or four corner points, I'm going to pick one, two, and three and end there. So I end up with that little triangle in the corner. And you can see on your drawing there's a reference. There's an arrow with a reference to that little diagonal to help you out. So I'll do the same thing surface from three or four corner points and I'll go one, two, three and to the midpoint there. Same thing, one, two, three and four. And I'm just right clicking to repeat the last command. There's three and then one more for this, one, two, three and four. So that's ultimately what I'm looking for is for all these separate little shapes. Now I've already created those shapes so it makes sense to just copy them to the back rather than redraw them. I of course could do them all again but I, in, I could just select them. Let me make sure I have just those selected. There we go. And then I can copy them. So I'll go to um, transform and then copy. It's going to ask me for my point to copy from. I'll pick that corner right there and we'll copy right to that corner right there. And I'll go ahead and press enter. So now I have the bulk of what this shape looks like, which is pretty good. Now I'd like to take a moment and point out that I've obviously I've made this shape, but remember back to that little quarter of the piece that I made or, or the line. If I do the same thing with this little small piece, I can use my mirrors to build this even faster. So if I went back to that piece and I went to rotate 3D and I said, okay, we're going to rotate this up. Let me hold down shift. There it is. Let me take this and let me offset it back by, this time it would be two feet. There. Then I could take these two curves, I could loft them together. Say OK. I could take those and explode them. I could add the surfaces on the end. Notice I'm only doing it on one side there. Now this could be very easily mirrored first there and then the whole thing could be done like that to create the shape. Do you see how I'm, I'm doing efficiency? So I'm modeling a quarter of it instead of the whole thing. So for our purposes today, there's no reason not to work through the whole object. But I want to show you this and I want to emphasize this because that's how you start to become more efficient. As you start to see this is the piece that I need and I can use my tools to, to save myself some work. So let me come back to this first piece here. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to control how these corners come together. And so if you've ever worked with concrete before or you've ever you know, observed concrete, good example is the little bench out here. You notice that instead of having a sharp edge on concrete, typically on the formwork for something that's finished like this, you have a little chamfer or a little bevel on the edge. And that's because that sharp edge of concrete, one, is uncomfortable if you were to sit on it, but two, has a tendency to break and chip when you remove formwork and stuff. So we'll, we'll, we'll basically create a chamfer on this edge uh, and all the way around for that matter, kind of like what's happening outside there. So to do that, I'm going to go up to the surface menu and I'm going to choose chamfer surfaces. Alternatively, I could type in chamfer SRF for chamfer surface. Up here in the command line, it says select first surface to chamfer, or let's pay attention to distances. So these are the distances uh, of the chamfer. Right now it's set at one inch by one inch, which is going to get a pretty good sized chamfer. I want to cut that down a little bit and do it at maybe a half inch by a half inch. So I'll type in I'll click on distance and then type in 0.5 and 0.5. When I'm done here, all I need to do is select the first surface, so we'll pick that surface, and then the second surface, that one. And you'll see that it creates that little chamfer for me. Likewise, I could chamfer from here to there and get that surface. I could move over to the inside and I'm, again, I'm right clicking to repeat the chamfer command. I could go from this surface to that surface. So that looks pretty good on top so far. But what about if I want to chamfer 
this surface and this surface. Well, now this, this corner is kind of getting a little messy. So we'll just go ahead and keep chamfering there and there. So I've worked my way there. We're going to come down here and we're going to chamfer those. And then we're going to chamfer this very bottom right there and there. Now because these are going to be connected together, I'm not going to worry about chamfering this front edge. We're going to skip that one for right now. But I can work my way over on this side and do the same thing. So those two, these two, these two, that one, and that one. And then I could do that one and that one there. So I've worked my way around and done the chamfers, but I'm still getting these kind of nasty little corners. So I need to clean those corners up. And this is what ultimately happens when you're working in Rhino, is you have to fix things. So because I've got this, I need to create an object that is going to help me to, to kind of control what I'm seeing and what I'm not seeing. And part of the goal today is for you guys to learn what you're seeing on the screen and how do you, how do you, how do you clean things up. So what I'll do is I'll create a line, a polyline, and I'm going to go from this corner to that corner to that corner and back to itself which is essentially creating a little tiny triangle that's right in the corner. Now notice when I try to orbit around that, it's really awkward. It's, it, moves, it moves out of my screen and I'm, I'm struggling to see that. Do you guys see how that works? So what I can do in Rhino is with an object like this selected, I can type Z for zoom followed by S for selected. And it's going to reorient my view around that object. So when I go to orbit, it's going to let me orbit right around just that one object, which is really, really convenient. So I'm going to zoom select it on that one object. I can really see what's going on here. And then I need to do some trims. So go ahead and type in the trim command, or go to edit and then trim, or press control T. And I'll get rid of these extra pieces that I don't really need. So I don't need that piece there. I don't need that piece there. I don't need this piece right there. I don't need that piece there. And pretty soon, you end up with uh, a hole, but a nice clean corner. Once that's nice and clean, I can go ahead and press Enter. And I have two options. I can do a surface from three or four corner points, which is pretty simple. Or I could do a patch to fill that piece in. So I just did a three or four corner points. I'll press Enter, and that fills that little corner in. Yeah. So I'm going to show you again on the next side. Okay. So over on this side. That's what I'm looking at now. So again, it's kind of messy. So what I want is I want a triangle that goes from this corner to the top to that corner there and then back on itself. And so I'll go in and I'll click on my polyline and I'll draw from this corner up to the top there, down to that corner there, and back across. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating the ends of where all of those chamfers should end. And then I can use the trim command, so control T or type trim, to get rid of this extra piece and that extra piece right there. Once that's done, this time I'll use the patch command. I can go to surface and then patch. I just need it to be two by two, so two U spans and two V spans. And I'll go ahead and say OK, and that fills that surface in as well. It doesn't matter which method you use. If you want it three or four corner points, that's fine. If you want to patch it, that's fine as well. So I've done those corners. In the interest of repetition, I'll move over here. I'll go ahead and draw my triangle again, like that. Now here's an opportunity if I went to try to move there, um, my view's off again. I can't orbit right around that point anymore. So here's another opportunity to do Z for zoom, followed by S for selected. I've reoriented my view around just that one object. And now I can go ahead and use my trim command again. So I'll type in trim. And we'll get rid of these extra pieces. There we go. And those are all trimmed off. Same thing for this corner. Back to my polyline, right there. I'll select that triangle, and then I'll type trim, and we'll get rid of those extra pieces. Oops. 
Sorry, didn't quite pick trim. And we'll get rid of that. And that, and that, and that, and that. There we go. Last thing I need to fill those in. So again, I can do, uh, let me hit enter. I can do a patch, which would fill that in. Two U spans, two V spans. Alternatively, I could do a surface from three or four corner points and fill that in right there and press enter as well. Either one of those options is just fine. So all of that turned out really pretty clean. If we scroll down here at the bottom, this seam is nice and clean as well. So those two chamfered nicely, so I don't have to worry about that. Then we get to this seam. Hmm. Well, there's a little bit of a problem there. So if we look closely at it, we can see that this surface comes down and meets the chamfer right there, but this front surface and the bottom surface meet at a different place. So they meet right there. So those are, those are a bit problematic. Now, if I were going to do a rendering of this shape, and I were rendering from out here, could I see that there's a little gap there? Nope, can't see it. In which case, it would be perfectly fine to leave it, and I don't really have to fix it. However, if I wanted this shape to be 3D printed, if I wanted to take it over and make one of these 3D prints of it, not that this is the most attractive shape and you'd want to 3D print it, but let's say for right now you wanted to 3D print it, that little error would make a big problem for 3D printing. It doesn't like those open uh, pieces. So let's talk about how you might fix it. So there's a couple different strategies for how you fix it. Uh, and I'll show you both strategies. One I think is a little bit easier, the other one is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'll tell you the difference. I'll do the first one on this left side here. So what I'll do is I'll use my polyline tool again, and this time I'm going to go from that corner in the middle, and I'll go out to where I meet up with that corner there, so the higher corner. And I'll go ahead and press enter. And when I do that, I can use that line that I just created, that line right there, as a trim. I'll go ahead and type in trim, and I can get rid of the extra surface there. So now I've got a line that goes from my corner here right up to meet at that point right there. I still have an opening here and an opening there, but if I were to delete this shape, oops, sorry, I have to finish the trim. If I were to just delete this shape, I could then use my surface from three or four corner points and just go one, two, three, and four, and that would then fill in that surface nice and clean without those openings. So what's the difference? Well, the difference here is that uh, the, um, the shape, this, this surface here, has an ever so slight twist to it. So it gets a little bit bigger and it twists. Could you tell? No. Does it make a nice 3D printable model? Absolutely. So we're tweaking it a little bit, we're faking it just a little bit from what it might really be, but it's close enough for our purposes. So that's a good strategy and it's pretty clean to work with. The other strategy is to work with the surface itself. And that is to take this surface that, uh, that was created and to use a command called untrim on it. And so if I type in untrim and I click on this edge, it'll give me the full surface of what it was. I can do that with either surface. I could do that with this surface. I could do it with that surface. But I'm going to untrim this. Then I'll select the surface itself. Oops, I have to press enter first. I'll select the surface itself and I'll come over here and say, show me the object control points. And when I do that, I get a little point in the corner right here. So that's that button right here. It looks like a circle with a couple dots next to it. And I can then select the point here of the surface. I can move that point, so I just typed in move. I can move that point to right there. And now I can use the surface itself as a trim right there. So I didn't have to draw the line. So technically, this method with the untrim is a faster way of doing this, but it involves a little bit more knowledge than just drawing a line and trimming it off and then uh, creating a new surface. So either way, we'll get you the same result on that lower corner. So I've now worked my way all the way around this edge and that edge. I need to repeat the process over on the back side. 
So I'm asking you guys today to do it this way where you actually build out all the, all the corners because it'll give you a lot of practice in how these come together and how to fix it and how to see what you're seeing. If I were building this from scratch, I would only build this quarter like I was talking about earlier and I would only do the chamfers on this corner. So I would come in here and I do chamfer surface. Oops. And I would do there to there, there to there, there to there, there to there. There. And like that. And then I would fix just this corner. So I'd come in and I'd do my first triangle. One, two, three, four. I'm going to type in Z for zoom, S for selected, so I can orbit right around that point. And then I can go ahead and trim, and we'll get rid of the pieces that I don't need. And then we'll patch it. Then I can come back over to this side, same thing, one, two, three, four, trim. There it is. Enter and then patch. Those two are fixed. Come down, I still have to fix this side. I might need to zoom select it again to select that object. I'm going to do the untrim method, so I'll type in untrim, which is actually a really cool command when you think about it, is that if you've trimmed something and you ever want the whole object back, you can just untrim it. Um, and that gives me the rest of the object. I'll then take the object, turn on my control points for that object, take my control point, move it, so it goes from there to right there. Then I can take my object, type in trim, and I can get rid of that part of the object right there. So I've just created right, this shape here. I can then take the whole shape, oops, let me hit escape there, take the whole shape, and I can mirror it and then mirror it again to create the whole object. So it's, it's certainly a more efficient way of doing it because I don't have to do all of the corners. But again, for your purposes, it doesn't hurt you to do all the corners because it's practice. Remember, today is always about practice. So when all of that's done, and I'm going to let you guys work through it. I know I went through it rather quickly, but that's okay. You guys will have the rest of the lab period to work on this. Uh, when you're all done, I want you to use the skills you learned in exercise 204, last class with V-Ray to go ahead and assign this material, uh, this object a material. You'll probably pick one of the concrete materials. And then give yourself the infinite plane underneath and the little directional light to get the lighting set up, and then perform a rendering. So what you're turning in today, or what you're posting on the course website, is a rendering of this little piece. A couple things to keep in mind when you're doing the rendering. When you create the infinite plane, there it is, it will show up on the ground in my case, this object is below where the ground would be, so I either need to take the infinite plane and move it down, or I need to take my object and move it up, one or the other. So there would be a move, V for vertical, and I can have that sitting up above the ground plane like that for my rendering. So assign the materials, create the directional light, create the rendering, and that's what you'll end up posting today. So I'm asking you to build on what we learned last class in V-Ray so that you actually have to assign materials and render. So I don't want captures anymore, I want actual renders.